Okay, this is Cheryl Dowd. How are you all today? It is the April, I can't believe it's April, but it's the April coordinator call and welcome to everybody. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started. We've got quite a few things to chat about today. Um, we're going to start with a little bit of, uh, from my welcome, you may recall we had State of the States there, and, and, and many times we really do not have anything new to share. However, I did want to advise you all that um, many of us were at NASAPS last week, um, which is the regulator conference, and they shared state updates, and I put that on the SAN website. You can find it in two different places. You can find it individually under research. Um, it'll say state updates, and you can also find it under past events from the, from the um, NASAPS conference. So you'll see that under past events. You click on that, and you'll find the, the link to get you to the listing of regulator changes. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of things about what we heard there. And probably the thing that struck me the most is that um, due to the concern about many closures of institutions, that the states are starting to look at additional requirements. So they've um, additionally looked at um, some sort of tuition recovery funds and also surety bonds or other type of surety instruments. Now these are for people, or excuse me, for institutions who are individually authorized in those states. But I think it's important for all of the institutions that participate in SARA to be aware of what states are requiring of non-SARA participating institutions. So what we're seeing is some states are adding fees that didn't have fees before, some states are adding surety bonds, and some are adding tuition recovery funds. These things are not something that a SARA participating institution will have to add, but you should be aware that the states are having to um, be concerned of this um, in light of some of the different things that have occurred lately in terms of school closures. So they're very concerned about that and very serious about wanting uh, to protect students um, who uh, attend these institutions. So just something to be aware of. Other than that, you may want to have a look at the different um, uh, different changes per state that you'll find in the document that I indicated on the SAN website. Um, the other thing in regard to states, I just wanted to reach out to you all. Dan and I have been going through the list of complaint processes per state um, to update that list. It was from May of 2018 was the last time it was updated, so it's due an update. Um, so the complaint processes that you all are required to share per 668.43b, that's something that's already, you know, that's been around um, since the two, it was first um, presented in the 2010 um, um, regulations, um, set of regulations for program integrity. But since then, you know, we've continued to update that list. Um, SHEO first did the list and then SAN took that over a couple years ago. And anyway, so in, in going through the process, there's some that I am having difficulty with. Um, I cannot find one um, for the U.S. Virgin Islands, and I've had difficulty discerning um, some in other states um, that are not SARA processes. It's really easy to find the SARA process, but we're talking about things that are non-SARA. So some institutions may have the same complaint process to apply for SARA institutions and non-SARA institutions under, under the different types of activities. However, um, some specifically indicate that through SARA, you would use this process. So um, as I was saying, the U.S. Virgin Islands is having difficulty with uh, Delaware, um, um, Louisiana and Maine. So if any of you all have the complaint process or can point me to it, um, I would really appreciate that. You can find different types of complaint process. One state, you know, shared um, the K-12 and it was clearly a K-12 process. So um, if you have any help that you can, uh, any direction that you can give me about the states that I mentioned, I'd appreciate it. Some you be, um, and you may recall that we've talked about this in terms of California because the regulation in 600.9a indicates there has to be a process to review and appropriately act on complaints. And as we've learned, the AG's office, some, they act on behalf of the state. They don't act as the for the or the support to the institution, although in some states they can do some sort of informal dispute resolution. But in terms of having process in place, that's what we're looking for. So if anybody has any um, additional direction on the ones that I mentioned, I would appreciate it. And 
just to remind you, please look and we'll talk about it a little bit more with NASA it's coming up here in a minute, but please look for the new resources that'll be on the SAN website, including state update. And I think that would be helpful. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Russ Poulin. We have, we're fortunate to have Russ with us today to talk with us about negotiated rulemaking. You may recall, and you've seen probably some articles from us um, and some notices about um, the negotiators in the main committee reached consensus, which is pretty amazing exciting. So there is some um, that will ultimately turn uh, proposed language. We'll see that later this summer, but I don't want to spoiler alert there, and I'll go ahead and turn this over to Russ and let him do the rest of it again. Okay. Um, Cheryl, Thanks, if Russ. you could let, let me share. Let's see. Sure. Um, new share. Um, Russ, I don't know how to do that. Well, Just I'll stop sharing. Just, you stop sharing. Okay. And, and now and you'll I'll, share. I'll start sharing. And we'll, we'll all be shared. There we go. There you go. Are you seeing my screen? I do. Dan, can you see the screen? Yep. Yes. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Thank All you. right. All right. Let's move move forward then. Okay. So the lovely negotiated rulemaking uh, is finally done, and uh, keep. Uh, but there's still parts of it that are that keep on going. Uh, so the uh, the main committee, which is the one that actually voted on all this, uh, uh, finished their meetings on April 3rd, and much to our surprise, that on the 50 plus issues, uh, they came to consensus. So they came to agreement uh, on, on on all the language that was uh, uh, that they negotiated and was uh, uh, put in front of them. And so what that means is is that we have a pretty good idea about uh, what the uh, what, what's going to be proposed and what's what's uh, going to be language moving moving forward because they they the education department needs to stick uh, pretty close to the language that uh, was negotiated. Uh, they are reviewing that language at this point that they're looking for uh, misspellings and punctuation and they're going to put citations in and they have to make think sure that some of the things they're proposing aren't like against the law. Uh, uh, so they're 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 checking all those those sorts of things and uh, putting in there. But if they they don't want to, they can't go too far afield from what's been uh, negotiated. And then the next step is once they've done that, is that they'll release the language for public comment. Uh, how much they can do with that comment is still kind of a question with it, but they do have to release it for comment. And then uh, uh, we will uh, be uh, pushing for you to. Uh, uh, be active in that comment period because uh, uh, we'll show some things here in a moment where uh, we uh, know some others are going to be commenting. So we want to we want to uh, uh, be sure to stand for uh, positions that you'd be interested in. And uh, finally, there that any uh, if, once they once they're done with the commenting, they have to uh, uh, respond to all the comments and then come up with final language. Uh, what will the final regulation look like? If they release that by uh, November 1st, uh, then of this year, then that language uh, becomes effective July 1st of next year. If they miss that date, then if they publish it after November 1st or sometime next year, then then it goes out to the next July 1st. But that is a uh, a deadline for uh, for regulations on that. So that's an overview of where we are with that. I wanted to go through. Uh, one issue in particular, and this has to do with the definition of the reciprocity uh, reciprocity agreement, and that this was uh, quite controversial. Uh, the, there is uh, uh, consumer protection folks. Uh, there's a, a few people who negotiated both in the subcommittee and in the main committee. Uh, really wanted to do a, a, a couple things. They wanted to make it so that um, each state could. Uh, 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 even if you were part of reciprocity, that they could still uh, enforce upon you if they wanted the, a refund uh, policy or a cancellation policy or make you be part of the tuition um, uh, tuition refund policy or, or pretty much any other regulation that they wanted to. Now, it was really interesting talking to these folks because if every state could do what it wanted, then what's reciprocity? But 
they said, well, you could still have reciprocity on some basic things, you know, just the approvals. And then, but we'd still put all these other things on there. But it, it really would uh, pretty much negate reciprocity. And, and that, remember that I said that they came to agreement on all the issues. And this really ended up being this one issue ended up being one of the sticking points that almost submarine the whole thing. Uh, and they were going back and forth and trying to come up with, and in fact, in the last days, the, uh, uh, there was the uh, consumer protection people even dug their heels in, in uh, more deeply. And so it was, it was really, uh, really interesting. And so there was this compromise that was reached, and we're going to go through the two parts, parts of it. The first part that we called the Ted Mitchell Compromise goes back to some language that was done before, and they also said that they were going to have a convening or a meeting around the concerns about Sarah, because uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that that as well. So the first part, the Ted Mitchell compromise, went back to saying that they would go back to the definition of reciprocity that was released in 2016 and was supposed to go into effect in in July of 2018, but as you recall, was delayed. Uh, and so it was delayed so we could do this negotiated rulemaking. And so there had been probably eight umpteen million different versions of what this should look like uh, through the negotiations, but they decided to go back to this and that both sides were able to uh, agree on that. Now, it's problematic in terms of when it came out, uh, the part that I have, uh, those highlights are mine down there, and that the part that I have bolded, and especially the underlying part, uh, it goes back to it says generally you're specifically directed regulations. You know that if they can't, if if a reciprocity agreement has to allow something that is a uh, regulation that is specifically directed at for-profit institutions or uh, is a requirement for again tuition refunds that you have to follow their tuition refund policy or most of other things. To me, when I first read that, when it first came out, it seemed like, well, okay, this is this is uh, negating reciprocity again. And then I wrote a blog post about that, and then um, which caught the attention of the Department of Education folks, and they said, oh no, you're wrong. That's not what it meant. And then what happened is that we got into back and forth with the department folks, uh, Marshall. Hill from uh, NC Sarah and I requested a clarification letter, and then the person who was the uh, undersecretary at the time, Ted Mitchell. Uh, so the undersecretary is the highest person for higher education within the Department of Education. So there's a secretary of education, and then there's a person under that who was the undersecretary at the time who ran higher education, wrote us a letter, and you can see at the bottom down there is the uh, link to this blog post where you, you can get the full letter if you want. But it's important to look at the bottom part that we have down here that says, in other words, a distance education reciprocity agreement may require a state to meet the requirements in terms of that agreement in order for the state to participate in that agreement. And so and they went on to say that the uh, there cannot be a conflict between uh, the reciprocity agreement and the uh, state laws if they if that state wants to use participation in the agreement uh, for that. And so that was really good and very helpful and it's what we wanted. Unfortunately, it does not have the rule of law because it was just a letter to us and that uh, the previous administration, remember Ted Mitchell was under the previous administration and they were heading out of town when all this was going down and uh, uh, did not get to the point where they could write an official letter uh, that would uh, would would define this as that's the way it is, and so we're in this you know odd spot where you look at the wording and you think it says one thing. The Department of Ed folks said it meant something kind of different, and so we had that and we lived in this. So going back to that language is a bit problematic because we now have the consumer protection people saying, "I'm going to back up," saying, "Well, it means exactly what it says. So we can do whatever we want," and then we have. Um, the Ted Mitchell letter here that says that, well, really, no, it meant that you have to follow the reciprocity um, uh, rules in order to, uh, to, to be in that. And, and, and in really, that our, we believe that the current, you know, this is the previous administration made that ruling. We, we believe that the current administration would uh, follow along with this thinking because uh, even at the NASAPS meeting that Diane Aaron Jones, who she has a different title, but she's the highest uh, higher ed person 
now in the Department of Education, she spoke there and uh, said that, you know, why would we want to get involved in what the states agreed to? So she seemed to uh, be agreeing with Ted Mitchell. So Republican and Democrat agreeing on things. That's news in itself. But uh, but here we have have this. So it's going to be an issue. And remember before when I said uh, we're going to need you to comment. So when this when all this comes out and the and the uh, regulations or pr proposed regulations are put out, we're going to come back to all of you and be interested and we'll, we'll give you advice about how to comment and what to do. But if you're interested in making sure that reciprocity stays and it's not done away with uh, pretty much that we'll want as many comments as possible and you can comment on your own or you can work with uh, your institution and you may want to start talking to uh, people in your government relations uh, area in terms of, you know, this is coming up we're going to want to comment and it'd be great if the institution would comment officially. And then you can also comment on your own. You can't do not use your letterhead unless your boss or the president or somebody says that you can, but you can say that, Oh, you know, hello, I'm uh, Cheryl Dowd and I'm the uh, state authorization person for Sinclair community college, which is what she used to be. Uh, you can say that as context. You just have to make sure that you're not, hinting anywhere that you're speaking on behalf of your institution because we like all of you and we don't want any of you to be fired. Uh, so don't do that stuff. So that's that's that and I'll take questions here in a moment and we'll go on. So we have that and then the other part of it was that a lot of the issues seem to be uh, that there's concerns about NC Sarah and how they run things and that uh, the consumer protection people had talked to them and had not got satisfaction, but uh, but that but that they had uh, they were fine with reciprocity, uh, but not with NC Sarah. Uh, but the problem with that is is I, I, that's what they kept saying. However, I think they want remember that they have sort of a skewed version of reciprocity. Any anyway, so so to help move things along, that uh, really have to. Uh, uh, thank uh, Terry Hartle from ACE and Dave Tanberg from SHIO, who were negotiators, and that they said, okay, well, how about if we hold a meeting, convening, uh, where we get some uh, folks from your side and some folks uh, on NC Sarah's side, and we talk about this, and can we address some of the issues and see what we can do about that? And that's all that was promised, it was a promise that this does this is outside of the Department of Education. This is... they. You know, NC Sarah didn't wasn't the one who proposed this, but but they're willing. It sounds like they're willing to go along, and they're willing. They said, you know, we're always willing to talk to people, and so that they're going to go along with it. And so uh, we'll we'll see what comes about that. There's been a lot of confusion about how this has been reported out. Uh, we want to let you know that this is where it's at. Uh, I have no further information about who will be involved or when this will be or, or any of those sorts of things. I've seen some conversation about uh, who should be involved, but but um, Terry Hartle is the government relations person with ACE is really heading it up along with Dave Canberg from, from SHIO and it's their gig. Um, and so, and I've nominated Cheryl to be our, to be somebody who should be involved in that conversation. Cause I think she knows about your stories and about what's going on and then could could represent beyond Sarah what's what's happening out there. Oh, so with that, uh, I'll pause and then see uh, see what sort of uh, uh, questions that that people have. Okay, does anybody have any questions of Russ? Um, you can unmute yourself or put it in the chat box, whichever you're most comfortable. Will Russ be willing to share his slides? Uh, yes, yeah. And uh, I'll be willing to share the slides. I'll send them out to you. And, and in fact, uh, at the end of that, and something I didn't go to is a little summary of what happened in the negotiated rulemaking that you'll probably enjoy as well. And so you can see that. So we'll, I'll send that to Dan, and then he can make sure to get it out to everyone. Great. Uh, Russ, um, Yolanda has a question. But before that, could you unshare? Because I think... I thought I'm I not, shared. Yeah, it's not doing it. Mine isn't. It's 
It hasn't come over to be my share yet. So while we're working on that, Yolanda has a question. Yolanda, would you like to share your question? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Russ, you said they have a skewed vision or a version, their idea of what reciprocity is, so they're okay with that, but not with Sarah. Do you think they have um, an idea or say an alternative to Sarah? They're, you know, in their view of reciprocity, have you heard anything that there might be something on the horizon that would compete with Sarah? I've heard talk of that several times, but it's talk because um, what they what they're saying is is that uh, well we're willing to have reciprocity, but it's only on the things around uh, you know how you approve an institution uh, and get this. But it but the the problem is is that when they talk about it, that they're describing something to which absolutely no institution would want to subscribe. Uh, and and so I've heard. Um, you know, uh, Bob Shireman is the former Department of Educa uh, Education person who's, you know, sort of been behind this idea. He's now in California, and it's been one of the reasons California hasn't joined, joined Sarah, but they have this notion that they can create something that's a, um, a little bit different. But if, but if all you got from Sarah was that you didn't have to seek approval, that would save you some. But if you had to you know, follow the refund policies, the, you know, all these other policies of all the other, other states, you know, without any limits uh, beyond that. And you had to pay fees and you had to uh, contribute to uh, uh, tuition recovery fund and you had to do all this sorts of things that, that, yes, they have a vague notion of what reciprocity agreement is. I just don't think that they have a workable notion of one. Great. Um, and then from Kelly, she asks, is they the feds or the rulemaking committee? It's a, that's a really good question. And sorry for, for uh, uh, misusing pronouns and all that. And so, so the, uh, there's a, it's a, a subset of the rulemaking committee who were representing uh, consumer protection folks. And I think they have the, the absolute right desires in term in, in mind in terms of trying to protect students and I think that there's perhaps some things that maybe need to be adjusted with Sarah in order to better protect students uh, so uh, it is not the Department of Education it, it, it is really uh, there is two three people on this on the subcommittee that I served on and then one or two people on, on the main committee the majority of people who were on both both of those both the subcommittee and the main committee understood about reciprocity and, and a lot of them were institutional representatives or uh, worked with institutions. They, un they understood that, uh, uh, you, you know, the, the, the problems with the concept of reciprocity that they were described, that the uh, consumer protection folks were describing. Great. Okay. Any other questions for Russ? Yeah, well, Russ, thanks for sharing those slides. I'll actually, I'll put them on the website um, with the, um, the uh, recording of Excellent. today's call. So we can, that'll go out to everybody. So um, thank you for being willing to share that. And I'm glad Dan brought that up. Thanks, Dan. Great, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Uh, okay, yeah, okay. Um, let's see. So can you all see my screen? Because it's saying that I'm sharing and yet I don't think I am. Can you see the... Uh, we can see it. I can all see right. It. it doesn't have the little green square around it to make me know that you can see it. So moving on. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dan now because Dan um, is going to share with us a bit about NASAPS. Um, we had a wonderful, uh, after we got there, the road, the, 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 uh, um, the trip out to Jacksonville was challenging for many, but once we got there, it was a terrific conference, and I'm going to turn it over to Dan to take it from there. Uh, excuse me. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess first, uh, this seems to be by far our absolute best uh, percentage of mute buttons, so you guys are all celebrating National Mute Button Day very well. Um, I, I think as far as the NASAPS convention goes, I... I um, I think it was. I think it was. Uh, it was meaningful and, and and always good to to make contacts with with the regulators and and get their perspective and have a chance to have our own network develop. 
Um, but we had a, a really standout performer there, Amber Hernandez from Florida State University. And I thought I would ask her to come up with a couple of good, of good nuggets that would um, help you guys, even those who did not get a chance to attend. So some of the learning that took place there, we're gonna now try to transfer that on the rest of the network. So Amber, are you there? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, just making sure. Um, hi guys, uh, thank you for your invitation to speak today. And um, I just wanted to share a couple of things. I know there was probably way too many to share on this one call, but um, it was kind of hard to pick out a few things. As usual, there was a ton of information regarding state authorization, SARA requirements and reporting, and new information on how to approach international student authorizations. Um, new this year, institutions will need to report on field placement data for their face-to-face -face programs. So that uh, will be a challenge for some, for sure, as we know that, um, uh, or may not know, a lot of this was kind of left in the laps of distance learning folks. And so now we're having to branch out into our different uh, organizations. So. Um, last year it was optional, but this year it is mandatory. So I know that's going to present a little bit of a challenge. Um, that being said, there was discussion about how to contact the departments, um, possibly through your provost office in order to get them on board. Um, your institutional research office can probably be very helpful with the numbers, but I have found in my search that most departments um, already have uh, people in place to that are tracking this. So it's best to use what's already in place. Um, and sometimes I tend to get what we called caught up among the weeds um, in little things that we think we have to do at all, but those processes have already been put in place in our institutions. So it's good to point that out and we can ask around and get more people on board to help us out. Um, in order to remain compliant in every program, one presenter was really helpful in suggesting to assign a regulatory dean within each department or licensure program that would help monitor external requirements for programmatic accreditation and state board requirements. This person within that particular program would understand the individual requirements and would help lighten the workload. Um, that way, if you don't understand maybe a regulation that is happening in, let's say, the nursing field, a fellow nurse practitioner who is the dean of the nursing school can help you out. And I thought that was a terrific idea. Um, that's just one of many examples. Um, many compliance spreadsheets were shared that other institutions uh, used in order to help keep all of the data under one roof, under control. Um, the best way to learn sometimes is through other institutions' examples. And there's many examples on the um, SAN website for the conference itself. Um, most presenters, I believe, if not all, have shared their slides and it's super duper helpful. Um, it is also important to pay attention to other countries' rules and laws. Just now we're getting into international student authorizations just as you would other states when it comes to state authorization. Certain programs may not be allowed to be offered within that country. Um, it is an important, important, important to work with your legal counsel as there may already be an international footprint already in place um, and the requirements can be super duper complex. So I'm not well versed in law and um, your legal counsel can give you terrific insight. Um, the wording to international students may need to be changed on your website or your information that you hand out to students to inform students of their responsibilities and limitations once they decide to take the program and return to their home country. So these are just a few of the notes that I took while I was at the conference. Um, and it's just valuable nuggets of information. And I hope that some of this is helpful um, and I might have gotten some of it wrong or right I'm not sure I see that I have a little note here <laughs>
So, um, but I will be happy to answer any questions that anybody has and um, or need clarification on. And I appreciate the opportunity to attend the conference. Thanks very much, Amber. That was a terrific recap. Um, and uh, I, I really appreciate uh, that you um, indicated that they can find those resources. Um, you can see the URL on my um, agenda there that it wasn't on the agenda that was sent to you, but it will be posted online what that URL is for you to be able to find all the different resources if you haven't found it through just searching on the site. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Dan. Um, Dan, do you have any other comments and thoughts or other questions that you'd like to bring out in terms of the NASAPS conference? Oh, I was just going to ask um, Amber if she had any um, suggestions for how we can improve for next year. Oh, goodness. <laughs> well, I know a lot of this stuff is a lot of people there. I saw a lot of new faces um, at this conference that I haven't necessarily seen before. So a lot of it is really, really, really useful information. I know I've heard um, a lot of it several times, but I always take a new, something away that's new to me. I always hear one, at least one thing new in each session that maybe I missed uh, from the year before or the couple months before attending a different you know, conference that you guys um, put on. So. It's really helpful to everyone. Um, maybe I don't know. I, yeah, I'll have to I'll have to think about that <laughs> to to think about what what new things we can do. I really appreciated the fact that a lot of presenters were more willing to collaborate with the information they had rather than kind of keep it to themselves. So it was a it was really really helpful information. It um, lessened the blow that we have to cover all programs throughout the whole institution because there is help out there. People are willing to help through other universities. So that's really nice. Okay, great. Thank you. If anybody um, else who was, uh, was at the conference would like to let us know if you have any suggestions now or, or later on where we're easy to reach. Yes, Yolanda. Hi, sorry, I had trouble taking it off of mute. Can you hear me now? Yep, yep, you're, it's coming okay. in loud and clear. Um, one thing I thought about because I was torn between some of the concurrent sessions and it just, you know, it was so awful. I went to one and the room was overflowing with people and they actually left and went to another one or just didn't go at all. So I was thinking perhaps, I, I don't know how we would, you know, how they would determine this, but if some of the sessions could be repeated if not the same day, possibly the following day. I don't know how it would be figured out, but it would be great. I did notice that there were quite a few that had overflow and people who wanted to stay there, but it was standing room only. They could not find a seat. And they went to another session and found that one great, but truly wanted to attend the original as well. As well. Thanks. Okay, that's good feedback, thank you. Dan, can I share a little bit about this that I think everyone probably needs to know? Um, we are guests with the NASAPS conference. They are very generous to allow us to collaborate on the agenda. And so what they've done is I've, um, you may have noticed those that attended that it was tracked. And so, and when I say tracked, there was in the morning regulator sessions SAN member sessions, and then there was a, a, another track that was if you were in neither. And we were open to having those that participate that are not part of SAN still attend um, some of our of our sessions. Um, you know, during the breakfast, you know, they have a specific breakfast for regulator SAN and neither. Um, we happened to do a session and we had a really great session provided by uh, James Madison University and University of Virginia uh, during the breakfast. However, the regulators and the others just had just breakfast and no session. After that, it was considered concurrent sessions. The SAN 
track stayed in one place. And so others find that the ones that the sessions that I have advocated for that are SAN focused or institution focused are something that others want to hear as well, which is exciting to me that others think that the our institution focused um, sessions are important. And so that is what happened. And, and one of our sessions was overflowing because uh, there were some folks that were interested in our topic area. And so we can talk to them about um, larger room size uh, because what they had done is they had left some tables in the back open, not realizing that non-institutions may wanna jump in and hear some of our sessions as well. Um, but that's something that's a, a real challenge as we're starting to, um, uh, as we collaborate with NASAPS on this, it's their annual conference. As I said, they are so generous um, to let us collaborate on the agenda. Um, and they will be sending out a survey. Um, somebody asked about a feedback survey. And so they will send out something um, in regard to their conference. But it is a NASAPS conference. It's just that we're really fortunate to be able but I appreciate what you're saying, Yolanda, and I am going to, I have it on my um, to-do list as well to talk to them next year about making sure that there is enough room at the back of the room for our SAN um, sessions that we can add people because um, it did get kind of uh, more than they could handle in that room. So I, I'm glad you said that. Thanks. Not only that, but there was a great session. I'll just give you a quick example. The um, Lisa session about communicating about state authorization and institutional examples took place at the same time as coding boot camps. It was hard to choose. And I, I understand that. And all I can tell you is that um, we have an inst it was an institution track and we wanted to make sure I was strongly advocating that any that SAN members um, proposals be used and so that's that's it was a priority to have our SAN people be able to, pr to provide those really important presentations. Thank you for your comments. I really do appreciate it Yolanda. That is a challenge for sure. Uh, okay, um, Dan, any final comments about NASAPS? Nope. Okay, Mary Beth, I see your question and I'm going to hold on to it, okay? I appreciate it. Um, we are going to get to it, but let, let's get through um, these items and uh, we'll, we'll circle back. Um, okay, so the next thing on our list is the uh, Basics Workshop Certificate of Achievement um, Summary of Results. Those of you who are not familiar with the, what this is, um, we recently held a Basics Workshop. Uh, SAN is uh, starting to tick our, tip our toe in to the idea of some kind of um, certificate or badging. And so we um, already have a curriculum in place. And so we decided that to be able to determine what an assessment would look like, we would see if we could incorporate an assessment um, to the basics workshop since we have, you know, that in place. So our, um, we had uh, 60 people. Um, at the, no, I lied. We had 50 people at the basics workshop and we offered them the opportunity to participate in an assessment. And this assessment cons was uh, 53 questions that were created by the, um, the mentors, uh, several of our presenters, and Dan and I contributed to the, to the bank, question bank. And so at random, um, a software called Exam Builder, and uh, randomly the um, participants would uh, receive 30 questions. To, uh, to achieve the mastery, it was called a mastery of, um, how did I say, say that exactly? Uh, demonstrated mastery in the credentials, concepts, and skills. So to achieve this mastery level, they had to receive an 80%, which meant that they had to get 24 questions out of the 30 correct. So um, the results turned out to be that 11 people chose not to take the exam, which is fine. It was their choice. It wasn't an extra cost to take the exam. Uh, 33 earned the certificate, and six did not pass the exam. Uh, you were offered the opportunity to take three times, up to three times. Um, 18 people passed it with the first attempt. 
14 in the second attempt, and then one person uh, took three attempts. And of the folks that never passed the exam, um, three did not, only took it once and did not continue. One took it twice and did not continue, and two took it all three times and did not continue. Um, so I thought it was really interesting. You know, we call this our beta group. They were our user testing. We, we learned a lot. Um, certainly, uh, we, we know about the questioning and what we want to do um, to make sure we do a better job with questioning. I don't think it will ever get um, to be uh, any easier as such, but I think we can be more effective with some of the questions um, that we asked. Uh, we appreciated some feedback from one of the mentor groups um, that shared uh, about um, some of the things that they encountered. One was about wording. Um, they indicated that there were different words used in the question than there were in the presentation. Um, and the questions, what we shared was it was open note, no time restraints. Um, and uh, so they could look all through the website. They could they could use whatever tools because as we shared, um, we we know that rules and regulations change, um, requirements change, but you have to know how to do the research, how to find things. So certainly these things were um, were were able to be found, such as um, a question that a, a number of people got wrong actually was um, had to do with uh, what was required on the. And they could have looked at the SARA application had they chosen to um, for the answers to that question, multiple choice. Um, but what I was saying about source language is you all are probably in a position, I know I am and, and Dan is and Russ is, where we get questions. And so the question can come with any bit of language and you have to then break it down into, okay, what are they really asking? So words that they use we have to translate into a way that we can manage it to try to be able to come up with an answer. So I don't know if we, if different wording would really be, um, would be beneficial. Um, and some indicated that it was harder than they anticipated, which is interesting because I, uh, we also received post, um, survey, um, a, a post workshop survey that they a handful thought that the basics workshop was basic and too easy and so you know we're really trying to do a good balance um, so I, I I do appreciate that feedback and so I, I do want to take that into consideration about the level of difficulty but also try to make sure that it's something that really um, covers mastery and, um, and one of the things that they came out and something that's new tool and I'm really glad they pointed this out is they want the the um, people who took the test wanted to see better feedback about the questions they did not answer correctly so we work on that um, you know to try to point to the content so that they can learn from um, the errors uh, on the exam um, which I appreciated that they that they indicated that because this is all a learning tool so you know it was our first time out uh, with me um, who earned their certificate and, and six that I'm sorry did not pass the exam. I felt like we, we were moving in the right direction. So I'm very grateful to our first group of test takers and we will learn from that and uh, use for future basic workshops. Do we eventually want to move on, try to do something with advanced topics? Sure. I don't think that that's in the cards for the advanced topics workshop in the fall. Um, we want to do a good job with building what this badge level or certificate level will look like for basics and then move from there. We certainly are moving in the right direction and want you all to be able to show that you've earned something. And, and uh, some people have asked that heard we were doing this, would this be something that's open to other members who aren't taking the, the workshop but would like to take the assessment to be able to be considered um, that they demonstrated mastery in these credentials um, of the of the credentials concepts and skills. Sure, that's that's something we're considering as well. So any of you would be able to to um, to take the assessment. I don't know if there will be a fee involved. I haven't gotten that far yet, but this is something Dan and Russ and I, you know, continue to talk about. But we wanted to 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 do this time this the first time and see how how it would go and we think that we have something good going and sure we need to make improvements but it was a really good start thank those that like i said that participated any questions about you know us trying to do this type of um 
achievement certificate um, for the basic learning of uh, the elements of uh, compliance management? Okay, um, if you do have any questions later, you know, don't hesitate to be in touch. Okay, uh, and nine, can you believe it? It is April, I am stunned. Um, somebody asked me about the next basics workshop. We do not have one planned for 2019, having just done that one, but we do have the advanced topics workshop in the fall. But we will, through the summer, be talking about where we're going with, with the basic workshop next. Um, but that's a really good question, thank you. Um, so, SAN 9 renewals. Uh, it is very important, you all as coordinators are the managers of your uh, memberships. And so it is with you that we rely for updates, and coordination um, with, if you have a, are part of a big membership, being able to coordinate with the other institutions that are part of your membership. So as you all know, we have individual institution memberships, small partnerships, and large partnerships. So at this time, and you will find a step-by-step -step process, we'll, do it, we'll send it by email too, but it's also posted on the website. Um, you can find that on the um, About SAN. You can find it where the statement of work, the last part indicates what the um, process is for renewal. It's the same as last year for those that are returning. You, would, you should review the statement of work and consult with other member institutions that are part of your membership, then one coordinator is gonna communicate with Dan if there are any changes uh, in your membership, maybe new coordinators, adding institutions, et cetera. So if there are changes, you will, you will communicate with Dan and that will be a part of the email and it's also listed on the website. If you have no changes, don't need to worry, you will automatically be renewed. And what that means is you have until June 1 to make changes. If you have no changes, then starting June 1, we will be sending out the invoices for SAN 9. So the invoices will start to go out after June 1. So you have from now until June 1 to make any changes to your membership and notify Dan. And so all of that, as I said, will be posted in and, um, you know, I would appreciate it if you would have some coordination with other parts of your, um, your membership. And if you will may recall that we also have a single point of contact for the invoices. So those of you that are part of a large membership will have to do um, a coordination with the others um, for payment. Um, I know that some of the uh, accept um, payment from other institutions and send out one payment from the institution that is the lead institution um, willing to manage the payment of the membership fee. So that's what we do so that we can have these coordinated memberships of multiple institutions so that we can uh, reach more people and um, share this work um, with you. So that's the SAN renewal process. You'll get an email to this effect and you can find it on the SAN website under about SAN and statement of work. Any questions? about this process. It's a relatively straightforward process. Okay, great. Um, so you will see that coming forward. So June 1 is the deadline to make changes and you'll start to see invoices come out in June. July 1 starts SAN 9. And uh, in SAN 9, there'll be some new things. Will be uh, those of you that participate in WCET um, already get WCET mix. Um, so it's a slightly different um, just email distribution uh, than the listserv we're currently using so that will, um, so we'll, we'll change up a little bit how the um, monthly e-newsletters go out so you'll see a little slightly different look as we move into SAN 9 pretty happy about that so um, one other thing I wanted to bring up is one of our members received a letter from the New Mexico Higher Education um, Department about participating in activities uh, in the state of New Mexico. And this reminded me, and this got brought up during NASAPS too, sometimes some of our instit institutions are still on distribution lists with some of the state higher ed agencies. So some of them are looking for some kind of proof that you're either um, going to have individual authorization um, from that state or that you participate in SARA. And so what we've indicated, yes, it is listed the SARA website, but as we've brought up 
and this used to come up more a couple years there were only about half the states participating in Sarah, but now that there are more, um, we have been sharing that please be a good colleague. Um, we think this is the best way to do it and reach back out to the state and share with them um, the letter that you are participating in Sarah as, as proof that you are. And then they can close the file on your institution because you are now participating in Sarah. Perhaps at some point you either had an exemption or you were authorized by that state. So they still have you as a matter of record. Um, attached to their state. So we, we do find that it's better to be a good colleague and share that. And that's just the better way to, to move forward with it. If you have any issues or concerns about that, let me know. Um, you know, we're always talking with our good um, Sarah colleagues and we can share any inst instances that we've, that we've encountered some difficulty, but this is a simple fix. Um, and just being good colleagues with our state regulators and letting them know um, you're participating in Sarah would be really helpful. Um, you'll notice that uh, next month, uh, the beginning of May, second Tuesday of May, we will have um, the impact of negotiated rulemaking on state authorization. Russ talked a little bit about um, the uh, state authorization reciprocity agreement. Um, it's important that we uh, are aware of, you know, ha what happened in the consensus language as we're going to see the proposed language coming forward soon. So here's your opportunity for Q&A. Um, we're still working on an expert. Um, we have several experts. I was working on one in particular that was sitting at the table that is unfortunately unavailable. I know some others at the table um, that I will be reaching out to just willing to um, the um, expert or experts of the month to ask questions about how um, that language came about and best uh, best ways to move forward. Uh, tomorrow, you still have an opportunity to register for the NC SARA 2019 data reporting requirements uh, webinar. You can learn about, and especially the placement situation, if you're still having questions about how to manage placements, Marianne Boki and um, Terry Strout will be on uh, the webcast tomorrow to answer your questions. And then finally, we have, uh, we're advertising here that we have opened the registration for the Advanced Topics Workshop. It will be held in St. Louis in the fall. The reason that we are waiting till fall is because we're aware that the proposed regulations will be coming out and we wanted to get beyond the proposed regulations so we know what the language is. We know that the comment period has occurred. There's an off chance that maybe the final regulations will have come out. That's an off chance probably later in October, but still we may have an indication of where things are moving. So we'll be able to talk about it. We'll also see the progress of um, HEA reauthorization throughout the summer so that we will have um, spokes, folks speaking as to uh, both of those areas um, for the workshop and then how to manage it at our institution. Um, 30 of them have already been registered. So we have uh, half of the, the seating is still available. We have not advertised outside of um, sharing with you all, except for the, it was in our blog post most recently, but um, I haven't put out any um, specific advertising uh, beyond our network yet. Um, so please take advantage of that opportunity. And um, let's see, the, the question that would be for uh, Mary Beth, uh, asked, does anyone receive further clarification about the California Nursing Board's new regulations for out-of-state offerings for clinical placement? Is anybody aware of that? Okay, and then we also have somebody asking about the um, it is at two Eastern, which means it's one. Um, it, those got reversed on the on the writing here. It is one Central Time and uh, twelve Mountain Time. Those Mountain Time and Central Time got reversed in the listing, as you see. It was going east to west. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, so that's great. And then Davida, to what extent will you be covering professional licensure disclosures at the Advanced Topics Workshop? Quite a bit. Uh, wonderful, it would be helpful to invite my colleague who will be leading this work for us. Absolutely. Thank you for that question. That professional licensure disclosures will be a big part of the workshop. Uh, any other questions? Is there a cap on the registration? Yes, we have places because of the room size and because we want it to be a So 30 have already, there are 30 that have already registered. We have 30 more open. 
Ann, do you, is there anything that I've missed that we need to share today? Um, not that I can think of. I think you've been pretty comprehensive. <laughs> Thank you. I Any other? You all have been great today. I really appreciate it. And thank you very much, Russ, for going over the uh, negotiated rulemaking and specifically about state authorization. Sure. Do you want me to do two minutes on Mary Beth's question? If you said something, Cheryl, I didn't oh, hear you. You're yes, cutting in please and out. Do. Sorry. Please, please go ahead. Okay. Can I, let's see. Let's see, can you get off screen share? I'll get on screen share and do this. And we'll do this pretty quickly. That, so I, I put this onto the slides and I'll resend those to, uh, uh, to Dan so they can send these out, out to them. But here's, here's the, uh, the language that is being changed and you can see it in the markup sense. And then on the next one, I, I have it without the markups. But, Really what they're doing is that they've done a couple of things is that they've included this notion of academic engages that you see in there and all. And that is something where it was a term that was used several places throughout uh, federal financial aid rules and all this. And I suggested, why don't you just define it? Yes, this was me suggesting, why don't you just define it and use that over and over again? And so here they're, they're using, using that again. They also got rid of some of the clunky language about the, the login and the password and proctored exams and just, uh, and have really uh, uh, said that you need to come up with some sort of process. And then they've also just changed the lettering here on the bottom here on this uh, uh, makes clear in writing. Uh, so let me go to the cleaner version here so that you can, um, so that you can see this. So really requires institutions to have a process in place through which the institution establishes that the student who registers in a course offered via distance or correspondence education is the same who academically engages in the course or program. So this is under uh, accreditation requirements. 602 is accreditation requirements. So the accreditor will be working with you on that. What I would say is that this is not really a substantial change to uh, uh, what language was there before? Maybe it's just clearing up some language that didn't re didn't really work in the in the in the past. So um, my fear is, is that anytime there's a change to this sort of language, the proctoring vendors, uh, the the vendors who sell these things, will say, oh, oh, the sky is falling, that you have to buy our product, and all these sorts of things. I'm not seeing it. So if you start hearing those sorts of things, uh, I, I don't buy it. I don't think that this is a, a huge change in it. And the accreditors will work on it and will work with the institutions to create something reasonable. And then I'll just finish up with, I did copy this whole notion of academic in, engagement. That's the one I pointed to that they, uh, that, that um, 602.17 points to this academic engagement. And you can look at this uh, at your leisure to see what this means, but this had been used in last day of attendance and uh, several other things, uh, uh, other notions throughout the regs. And then now they've just uh, uh, encoded it in the definitions for, uh, for that. And so you can, that's uh, the quick opinion and you'll get that language. So uh, thank you. And thanks Mary Beth for asking. I appreciate that, Russ. I'm glad we could get that in. That was wonderful. Um, any other last comments? All right, super. We covered a lot. Uh, thanks again, Russ. And uh, things will be posted, these slides that Russ has shared. Um, plus, you'll get an email about renewals. Um, thanks for sharing about the, the workshop. A couple of you have contacted me about um, some ideas. Appreciate that. And also the ideals about NASAPs. Everybody, have a great uh, rest of your month. And we'll be talking to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.